cyber threats in 2021 are all around us. And while 2020 was bad, it seems that 2021 has even worse in some ways with various major events and cyber attacks impacting organizations around the world. So what are the threats out there and how can you protect yourself against them? I'm Danny Palmer. This is ZDNet Security Update. With me to discuss the cybersecurity threats out there is Anne Johnson, Corporate Vice President at Microsoft. Thanks for joining me, Anne. So first of all, what's out there at the moment? There's obviously quite a lot of things. So what are some of the key ones that people should be thinking about? Yeah, so, you know, ransomware continues to be really the top threat. I know that, you know, recently we've seen a lot of nation state threats that have had a lot of um, big impact because there were point in time activities and they were broad and they had a lot of, um, there was a lot of customers who were concerned about them, a lot of media, you know, news around them. But at the end of the day, the nation states will continue actually to be more sophisticated. We're going to see that, but customers really need to be concerned about ransomware. We continue to see an increase in ransomware, human operations rated ransomware is the most common threat we're seeing right now. And still the ransomware actors are attacking our customers via spear phishing. I mean, there is, you know, there's always will be new threats, but we really need to address the most common threats. And that is spear phishing and that is ransomware and particularly human operated ransomware right now. So why is it that ransomware has become such a big issue over the course of the last year? I mean, it's been a problem for a number of years now. And we remember various things like Lockheed and Cerbera a few years ago, where ransoms used to be a few hundred dollars. Now you've got ransoms asking for millions of dollars and the, the attack seems to be more prolific than ever. So why is this the case? The ransomware actors have figured out that they can attack, you know, that low, what we call low hanging fruit, right? They can go into places where they have a minimum barrier to entry. It's a great return on investment for them. And they're going into entities that don't necessarily have a lot of sophistication and investment in their IT systems or in their cybersecurity. And that human operated, you know, ability to take over one department, right? So if they're going into a government entity, take over one department, launch the ransomware, get a payout, then take over the next department. They're figuring out a really great way to monetize their efforts and they don't have to develop all kinds of new tooling to do it. So it's a really low cost attack. One of the things we talk about a lot is raising the cost to the attacker because the more you can raise the cost to the attacker, you reduce the return on investment and it's gonna be less interesting to them. That's one of the things why this is proving so popular because it ultimately is uh, probably the easiest way for uh, cyber criminals to make money if they have access to a network at the moment. You know, maybe in the past they, they would look at you know, what data was available on there and sell it on some underground forum. Now they are going in and you know, encrypting your data and saying, you know, pay us, otherwise you won't get this back. Or even now the added caveat of pay us and you won't get this back. Or if you don't pay us, we're releasing this data. They're not even charging anyone for that data anymore. They're just throwing it out there as part of this, this extortion scheme, which is unfortunately proving to be really effective uh, this year. Yeah, because people, you know, customers and, you know, government entities globally, they don't want their data out in the public. So there's that double, you know, threat. We're not going to release the data to you or release your systems, they're encrypted, but also we're going to release this embarrassing data or this super confidential data or IP free. You know, we're going to put it out there for anyone to visit. So it's something that, you know, when you're thinking about, we recommend that people never pay the ransom, by the way, but it's something that as we work with entities on a global basis, they're very concerned about. it. And they're often going after what are perceived as soft targets as well. We see a lot of reports yeah. about universities and schools falling victim to uh, these campaigns, which is, you know, adds another element to, uh, you know, privacy and security here because, you know, releasing information about students is going to be very damaging and there's potentially information about children from schools that could be released. There was a recent case here in the UK where a whole group of schools got affected with ransomware and the attackers were asking for some fee of millions uh, of uh, uh, pounds or dollars in, in Bitcoin, which seems to be uh, an interesting tactic in a number of ways because you know, at least here in the UK, public sector bodies are not renowned for being made of money. But here they are yeah. demanding these fees, but they wouldn't be demanding these fees if companies weren't paying uh, the, them in, in some ways. I mean, a lot of companies do not pay this ransom. And as you say, you know, paying the ransom is never recommended. But unfortunately, there are many uh, victims who perhaps reluctantly see this as the best way of moving forward. 
Well, they see this the only way, right? And I, I can say they attack they attack those soft targets, healthcare organizations where they know there's urgency to get systems back online and also a lot of confidentiality and data. You talked about schools, um, you know, schools with young children, universities, and some of these organizations just feel they have no recourse but to pay. Um, one of the things that, you know, would be incredibly important for organizations is not even to think about their cybersecurity, but also to think about their backups, right? How effectively are they backing up? Are they testing their backups? And are their backups offline? Meaning that if they do have a ransomware event, are the backups in a place that the ransomware isn't going to impact it? Because that's one of the, you know, it's not easy, but it's one of the most effective ways of not paying the ransom is just saying, well, no, we can bring our systems back online very easily. We just need to get you out of our environment and make sure you're not in, and then we can just restore from our backups. Which does seem a useful way of doing it. I've spoken to organizations which have done that where, it takes time and effort to restore from their backups, maybe a week or two to get the, the systems, uh, the basic systems they need back online, then maybe a bit more time to make sure everything else is okay. But ultimately that's going to be better than you know, uh, losing millions of uh, uh, millions to cyber criminals and then you know, encouraging cyber criminals to, to, to do these campaigns. I mean, there was a, re a recent report by the UK National Cybersecurity Centre, which didn't name names, but detailed an attack where the company paid the ransom, uh, didn't alter their security afterwards, and the same attackers came back and did it again, which just goes to show that how uh, learning from experiences is a, a great way of protecting your network and learning from the experiences of others, uh, looking at cyber attacks which have happened and learning that you should you know, do certain things to protect your network from attacks. Yeah, and I've recently um, joined the board of this company, CYE in Israel, which believes we have a good method for doing this in an automated way, right? So actually you looking, doing a, an automated security assessment, having some human red team entities, and then evaluating your business risk, but also putting in a mitigation plan, right? So when I think about what companies need to do, it's, you need to, you know, one of the first steps is understanding actually where your data is. You'd be surprised about how many entities actually don't know where all of their data resides because they have legacy systems. They have what we call, you know, shadow IT. Someone stood up a system in their department for something and there's data there. So that security assessment part is incredibly important because you actually need to understand where your weaknesses are, but also where the most critical assets for your organization are, and then tie those to business risk and make spending decisions. This isn't a matter anymore of taking a, a, an approach where you're spending equally on every part of your organization to secure it. You actually need to understand your business risk and where the most important assets are for your organization and spend accordingly to protect that so that when you do have an event, you can bring yourself back online very quickly because you know that the most important assets within your organization are secure. And when it, when it comes to the human element, we've discussed how the attackers are very much hands-on uh, in these campaigns, you know, actively you know, moving throughout the networks uh, themselves. How can uh, people on sort of, for want of a better phrase, the, the defending side uh, you know, operates in order to help uh, stop these attacks? Because you know, we, we're in a situation here, as you know, if people watching this can see, you know, we are talking to each other from our homes because the current situation means that a lot of people are having to work from home, which means a lot of people aren't inside corporate firewalls anymore. Yeah. It's making it much more difficult to protect against cyber attacks, especially when all of our uh, communication is done in a virtual in environment. I mean, we all have more emails, more DMs, more uh, collaboration services with, with people saying, you know, click this link, open this file. And that's just creating an environment which is uh, attackers are unfortunately taking advantage of. Yeah, so we talk a lot about, and I, I don't want it to sound like a buzz phrase, so I'm going to define it a little. We talk a lot about zero trust, right? And what zero trust means is a few fundamental things. One, you want to be using strong authentication for anyone that accesses your environment. We know that like 99% of hacks have some type of password element. However, that password was stolen. So using strong authentication will at least give you a first line of defense against that. The second thing, though, is least privilege, right? Working from home is a great example. So, you know, a lot of folks as they work from home, you know, we're, I always say at Microsoft, we're a little spoiled because Microsoft gives us our 
our computers. The computers are configured. The computers are secure. We have built in strong authentication. That's not the case for most entities globally, right? And they may be sharing their device with their child who's doing schooling and then malware could come in that way. So having least privilege on that device and having that device not be able to do anything but the minimum for the job is incredibly important. Your end users do not need admin privilege, trust me, um, the majority of them. In addition, your admin should be working in some type of secure environment. The other thing though, with zero trust, and you talked about the working from home, right? You're on a home network. You're not necessarily as secured, depending on what environment in, maybe you're sharing bandwidth with your neighbors, right? Um, you need to interrogate every transaction in the session. And that's part of the zero trust principle. So it's not just about the human identity, it's the device identity, it's the network health, it's the application, it's the data you're accessing. Any of those places could be a potential for actually having a threat come into your environment and doing that in an automated fashion and actually having a machine learning capability that aggregates those threats and very quickly that's the thing. Time to detection has to be really fast because even if someone comes in, you assume breach, you assume someone is in, your ability to detect them, to block them, to stop them from going anywhere else in the environment is going to make the difference to whether you just have a small intrusion or a wholesale ransomware event that takes out your business operations. And that's one of the key things here, you know, detecting these incidents because as you say, you know, it's obviously bad if you detect some sort of uh, unauthorized activity on your network and uh, let's say a single account. But if you detect that when it is in a, just a single account rather than in you know, dozens of accounts and all over the network and oh no, it's exactly. actually ransomware, it's encrypted the entire thing. Cutting off at the pass is always going to be uh, the, the next best thing to you know, stopping uh, things getting inside your network entirely, which in this day and age, it is it's difficult to do, I suppose, because as detailed, there's so many types of threats out there which are trying to exploit every single angle they can in order to break into networks. And we're recording this on the day where there's just been um, you know, indictments or you know, sanctions again are made because about cyber attacks, uh, corporate compromising corporate networks. So it's yeah. such a major threat nowadays, and it's it, it's it's it, a tricky thing to uh, stay on top of, unfortunately. Well, the thing is, so let's go back to the nation states for a minute, right? They're getting really smart on reconnaissance and they know what we're looking for, right? They know how our endpoint solutions behave. They know don't, no matter who the vendor is, right? They're doing research and they're saying, okay, we understand how the we understand how the blue teams defend. We understand how their red teams attack. They've gotten really smart. That's that why that interrogating every transaction that happens in a session, you will find anomalous behavior. And then being able to actually correlate that anomalous behavior so that your software doesn't get overwhelmed. That's the other problem is we have a tremendous amount of sock fatigue. In almost every breach we investigate, we find there's sock fatigue, right? So that ability to automate function for your sock based on whatever your risk assessment was um, and make sure that your sock is only responding to the most important alerts. It's it's another element that you have to actually use. It's the one place, you know, I, I don't always want to overstate the power of machine learning and the power of artificial intelligence, but the one place it has a lot of relevance is correlating those signals and serving up to your SOC only the most important things. So to sum up, I suppose, what are some of the key things which uh, organizations should be doing in order to uh, protect their networks from cyber attacks and help users uh, stay protected from all the different types of threats uh, that are out there right now? Yeah, so number one, I, and I, I, I joke, um, it's, it's, it's a rather... Um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's a joke that's not great, but I joke they're going to put this on my tombstone, literally. But use multi-factor authentication for 100% of the people that access your environment 100% of the time. That is number one. The second thing is you need to really be in a zero trust world at this point in time with assuming breach, interrogating every transaction in this section. And the first thing I would do is least privilege. That is the absolute first thing I would do because it's something that doesn't require you to go buy technology. It's just an operational control you can put in your environment and then take advantage of the service providers. You know, we, I talked briefly about CYE, but take advantage of the service providers that can come in and do a third party security assessment for you that can help you understand business risk and then actually can help you build that mitigation plan because 
no matter how sophisticated your security team is, they have blind spots. And you really need to find that trusted provider that can help you find those blind spots and build in the right mitigations and controls and introduce a lot of automation. At the end of the day, Danny, there's not enough humans, right? We have to leverage automation. We have to leverage machine learning and we have to leverage it in the right way. But we also, and I did another, um, I'm actually recording an event, but I've been working a lot on um, securing machine learning models too, because they are going to become one of those areas where people either attack the data or attack the machine learning module. So as you become more sophisticated and more, you know, it becomes more pervasive, make sure you're also securing your machine learning model. Hopefully that's some that's some really good advice for uh, people watching this. Uh, thanks for joining me, Anne. It's been very much appreciate, appreciated you joining me on ZDNet Security Update. And for more information on how to keep your organization safe online, uh, be sure to keep watching ZDNet Security Update. And of course, there's plenty of articles and features on ZDNet.com. Thanks for watching.